I think we were playing Rock'em Park in 2005, and uh, we were on this bus with a skylight, mm-hmm. and Cam was out, our singer was out yelling, he was totally, we were all so drunk, and Cam's yelling out, like, Bachman Turner Overdrive, and just being a total maniac and shit. So I'm out the skylight, and I'm facing the other way, like, I'm, I'm facing, that, like, the bus is going this way, I'm uh-huh. looking backwards at all the people being drunk, and I see this sign go like this, like, oh, like this sign that, with, that was attached to like a, a post and shit, and it was like a street sign, and then fucking <laughs> right past my head, and like seriously, if I was underneath that sign, I, my head would have, my body would have gone back in the bus without a head, and I was like, alright, I'm never going to stick my head out ever again, <laughs> <laughs> like, like that was just one of those things where I was like, fuck, okay, it's like, Taking a taking a minute to just sort of calm myself down and like, all right, I was a total idiot just now. Yeah. I'm never gonna stick my head out of skylight. <laughs> not look where the bus is going. Oh so, man. Yeah. Anyway. Well, when you guys have experiences like that, do you ever get sick of touring? Like, do you ever just not want to be on the road? Um no. I think of I think of like say our worst day being on the road. I look back when I was working construction my worst day playing music would have been my best day of my life at that point oh, okay. so you know we're not working construction we're just playing music for a living mm-hmm. so I, I think if I'm having the worst day of my life boohoo for me if I'm playing music every day yeah. and we all kind of have that attitude you know things could be a whole lot worse so I think well I just get bothered when I see interviews about, about people complaining Yeah. it's like you know what man Things would be a lot worse, so you know that that doesn't really you know come into my mind or, yeah. at all. No, I agree fully. It's like, is it's definitely like a privilege to be playing, you know, music that you love in front of you know traveling around and having that as your, you know, that's that's your living. Like, and I totally love it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And you know, I'm sure we rough it out and stuff, but it's all part of the. Adventure. It's all part of the deal. Yeah. And yeah, I just think in general, like if, if someone finds something they love to do in life and get to do it for a living, then you know you've kind of won the lottery a little bit like that. So. How do you feel right now, being where you're at as far as your band goes? I mean, you guys have both been for, or you played with Maiden at a festival. You know, I mean, you get to you've gotten to meet some of your biggest heroes. I think is it satisfying? It's very sure. satisfying, and it's kind of like. We've all already exceeded our expectations of what we could do with this band. Mm-hmm. So everything now, you know, we have another record out. We're doing a CD release party tonight, and it's like anything now that happens as far as, you know, playing with a really big band or even meeting in a big band, it's, it's all icing on the cake. Yeah. Actually, at this point, it's <laughs> a cherry on top of the icing of the cake. So, <laughs> yeah, great. We're, we're definitely, still doing it. we're all stoked to, to be to to where we are now. I mean, it's really it's really amazing. We work we work really hard, so we we just appreciate the support that we get. But at the same time, we're all we're all from underground bands, and we have done like the underground uh, circuit many times, and have, and know what it's like to start from the ground up. I mean, the, for me, the worst case scenario would be like if say something happened. It's not like I'd be like, okay, I, I don't want to start from scratch. I know how it is starting from the ground up with bands, and I, I like just playing music in general. To me, uh, if I, I'm always going to be playing music. I don't care where the band's at. I just always want to be doing it. So, you know, even if, you know, we had to, we're, we have this great opportunity now where we're playing these great shows, but if we didn't have this opportunity yet, I would still be stoked to be playing, you know? Jump back in the van and hit the road again. We still travel in a van. Yeah. Though, so. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I don't know if that makes sense. but Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I mean, with all the years that you guys have been doing it, you know, just building up from, you know, your previous bands and building up with this band, um, are there memories that stick out, certain ones? I've got a lot of memories of not having memories. Oh, yeah? Yeah, like... Because you're drunk or... Yeah, like, you know, I'm, there's good times that we've had that are... You can't, you can't re- really... 
you know, like, you'll meet other musicians who can relate to these moments, but it's like, you know, you'll be on a tour and you'll, you'll meet these new bands that you've never toured with and you find that you're, you've got like-minded people and you're basing, basically meeting groups of new best friends and then <clears throat> collectively, you know, these 20 people will have a month of the best time ever, playing the best shows, like, you know, hand, handfuls of tours with bands like that. Black Dahlia Murder is a good example. Uh, Exodus. You know, we've we've had just really amazing full tours, and some of them just you know the memory is could all be one night, like tw- twenty times in a row. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but uh, you, you keep your head together, but it's all about playing good shows. You know. Definitely. I speak of partying and stuff, but the re- the whole reason we're on the road is to play good shows. So, you know, my advice would just party after the show. Play the best you can. We've all, people. yeah, we've all, like, had, you know, there have been a couple of times where we've, you know, gotten a little wasted before a show, and yeah. definitely, we've all had to talk to each other about just this, like, remember, you know. Hey, man, let's not, uh, let's not ever do that again, right? <laughs> cool. It's like, yeah, I really liked your dance move the whole time, you're like this. <laughs> it's called the sway. That's funny. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool that you mentioned the Black Dahlia Murder guys. Um, when I did an interview with them, they told me about this one time. Or they told me about their bassist and how they were doing shrooms one time and the bassist chipped his tooth on the shroom. Did you guys ever hear that story? No. no. Well, next time you see You guys are coming up on a tour it with them soon, right? may have after. <laughs> Ask them about that. But uh, I'm assuming you guys don't have any tooth chipping shroom stories. No. I did buy a box of fresh mushrooms in Holland once, oh. and uh, the Neurosis record, Eye of Every Storm, saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's true. You, yeah, yeah. you remember that. Elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the hallucinogens are, are really quite something, and it's all about the set you know, the setting of where you are and who you're with. And I was having a really bad, horrible trip. You know, the kind of thing where everything's melting, but you don't want anything to be melting. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, so, our base player at the time, him and I, that's what we were doing. And we're sharing a bus with a, with another, actually two, was it two other bands? With one other band. And we locked ourselves in the back of the bus and just turned off the lights. And the neuro- That neurosis record's great, by the way. But it, it really was like... It just brought us yeah. down and made us made us feel like good. Everything's gonna be okay, kind of thing. Um, but I can't really say anymore. It was like it was one of those points in time that uh, I'm never gonna do that again. You know what I mean? <laughs> that kind of point in time. Yeah. Let's <laughs> we'll talk about the recording process. You guys worked with a producer who has like so much experience yeah. you know, on the, the last record you worked with Jack and how does that contrast from working with Joey Jordison you know someone who was you know fairly up and coming in the, the producer world well you know like generally speaking you know each producer um, yeah, they're all individuals everyone works differently you know like um, Jack is coming from where he's coming from he's done a million sessions since he started in like the late 80s you know? and we're we're fans of a lot of things he did, like from past till present. He's done some great stuff, like the latest High on Fire. And, uh, he's worked with Zeke and like uh, Toxic Holocaust and stuff. But you know, there's there's older albums like Grinning Like an Undertaker by The Accused and uh, Infrared Riding Hood by Tad. These really like huge sounding records. Yeah. Uh, we we just like the sonic. Where he's coming from sonically, we wanted to capture the band as we are live. And he doesn't, he doesn't really like to work with click tracks or sampled drum sounds or, or anything. It's basically the band and a bunch of microphones, you know. So that's, that's how we wanted to do this album. And we had worked with him previously, you know, briefly. Uh, Joey Jordison uh, did the last one. And uh, he worked with, uh, Joey did our demos for that album, but Jack ended up engineering that. So we saw how he worked and... We built a rapport with him then, okay. and uh, I would talk to him periodically, just by chance, over the years and stuff. And then 
we just listened to so many of his albums, like, you know, Until the Living End by Zeke, uh, and, you know, the latest High on Fire record, and we just, we really wanted to capture, again, capture our band as we are live, and he, he was on the same page as us. We actually didn't, we didn't really go through a list of people, you know. There's a, there's a lot of great people to work with out there, and it, this is just where our band is at this point in time, <laughs> you know. Things worked out really good that way. So, and we had a quick meeting with him too when he was in Vancouver, and we all met him outside the venue that his band was playing, Candy Coated. They were playing at a venue in Vancouver, and we had a chat with him about, you know, this is, you know, just where we wanted to go with the record. And we told him the covers that we were doing, and he was just so stoked with, you know the organic nature of where we wanted to take this record and yeah. it was, it's right up his alley like we had we had like so much in common with the music that we listened to but he also introduced us, introduced us to tons of killer shit like while we were in the studio we just got along with him such a in, the, in such a musical level like he's really cool and yeah I don't know what else to say except I just, we had a great time working with him and shit you mentioned how you didn't use click tracks and with the uh, with the recording process. Um, I ask fans this all the time, and with technology and how it affects music, in particular with metal, do you think that click tracks and technology can affect it in a negative way? It definitely it depends on the band. You know, like <clears throat> there's some classic records to you know there's some classic records that use technology to to its advantage you know like a really classic one is D Manufacture by Fear Factory that's the type of band that really takes that technology and makes it a part of their band you know but just it depends like for us to do a live sounding record had we used the click tracks and the tr sample drum sound it would kind of sound like our last record you know like we we went that route, and that album is great, you know. And it's, but we don't want to repeat ourselves, you know. We've, we've sure. toured so much since then. We this time around, technology would have ruined the whole vibe of this yeah. album, you know, because we've got that almost '70s recording technique, mm -hmm. um, a certain feel and you know live sound of the band would get completely lost, right? You know, even before Pro Tools and stuff, you look at Injustice for All, which is very, it's clinically tight, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's tight and as great a Metallica was, you know, at the time that the album came out, it never sounded like the album live. And again, you know, there's bass live. And, uh, um, so I, I just think it depends on the band, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, band, there's bands yeah. coming out now that, you know, they sound amazing. Their album is awesome. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 to a certain degree, though, can get a little bit boring. Like, it can get a little stale. Like, what I'm, what I'm referring to is, like, there were a lot of death metal bands. Like, a lot of the death metal bands that I grew up listening to, like, the real heavy bands. Like, I don't know, we'll take old B-side records and, like, Obituary and, like, those old Scott Burns records. Like, they they had a real, like, organic quality to them as well and they're really fucking heavy and really tight and the drums sound a killer and it was just like a solid record and there's this new I mean, there's a lot of bands that are I don't know it seems like everything's so triggered that yeah. it kind of that it, like drum, everything's triggered like everything all the drums sound exactly the same in so many of these records like it's a little bit it's, a, it's kind of interesting like I personally am not into triggered sampled drums because it kind of it obviously takes away the organic feeling of the record but you know it's uh yeah like I don't I don't really get that so much I don't really I kind of miss the sound of the old of the old um, you know classic records they sounded great you know they're they're uh you know they're they're class they're classic death metal records I I just uh, like to hear more bands sort of Follow in the way of the old yeah. style, and if you if you're gonna be a hard hitting drummer, hit hard. You know what I mean? Like, and if you're like, if you're just tapping on the drums or whatever, and using clicks to really like turn it up, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that that's everyone's thing. That's to each his own, I guess. Did you guys record on tape or was it digital? Some of it was recorded on tape. Jack, the way Jack liked to do it was uh, 
uh, most of the drums were recorded through tape, and uh, he would he would use that as just he'd use the natural compression from that, to get a very nice warm analog sound. Uh, other than that, we did we did record on the Pro Tools, which you know from and we we rely on a guy like Jack who's worked a lot with both. That's where technology comes in handy. You can get the same sounds at a much uh, a much more quick paced environment, you know. Uh, so you know, like it goes hand in hand, you know, like like Justin said, you know, in in to sum up kind of what he said, it's like depends on the band, you know. You know, uh, but you know, analog analog does sound great for for kick and snare yeah. and stuff. And something like Pro Tools is like is a obviously a faster way for an engineer because you know no one wants to cut through tape anymore. Yeah, you know exactly. that that just takes so much time and yeah. it's really expensive. So I mean, uh, like something like Pro Tools is good for dumping tracks on and working on it from there. Like and uh, yeah, I mean there are definitely like technology. There are mod there's so much modern technology, especially home studio stuff where you can people are, are recording albums right at their own home you know yeah. you hear lots of bands having like home pro tools here and stuff so. you just said how do you how you'd like to see more bands go back to the old school kind of absolutely kind of feels do you come ac- do you come across bands that have a perfectly sounding record and then they can't duplicate it live yeah that happens all the time we're definitely gonna I'm not gonna name any okay. bands but a lot of bands, you know, spend a lot of time making that perfect clinical, you know, that clinically sounding record where there's the impossibility of reproducing it live. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are great drummers out there. A lot of death metal drummers are amazing and stuff, but, you know. <clears throat> I'm not saying I want to hear bands do more stuff like live or, you know, I don't want to. He- I don't want to hear other bands do what we're doing because it's to each their own. But um, it's just like it's a very human thing, you know. Humans are faulted creatures, you know. You can hear pick scrapes and whatnot on our album, but you know you're going to hear that same band that you hear on the album live, and that's what's most yeah. important to us. We couldn't really give a shit what other bands are doing because that's like, it's just kind of like saying, hey, you know what, man, you, when you speak French, your French accent sucks. You know, like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of, when you boil it all down, you got to just pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, like every band's got their own style and they do their own thing and they, and you know, bands do it the way they want to do it. That's, that's the way it should be. And, uh, yeah, like, with this, with our new record, we we went at it like we wanted it to, we wanted to sound live and certain takes and certain things, certain the tempo, the tempo and all that stuff. You know, I mean, it's not it wasn't it's not 100% perfect, but when we were in the studio, it was the way it was the way we wanted to sound and it sounded great and that's how it's gonna sound live. You know, yeah, and that's what we want. This 